afternoon, everyone. We'll um, get underway. Um, my name's Trina Burgess. I'm the research director in the Harry Butler Institute. And so I would just like to um, welcome you here today on behalf of the Harry Butler Institute and the Department of Water and, and Environmental Regulation, as most of you probably know as DWER. So the very first thing I would like to do today is it's a very great pleasure to um, welcome Auntie Marie Taylor here to do a welcome to country for us. And we're very privileged to have her here today. And following Auntie Marie, there is actually going to be a video welcome from Michelle Williams. So I will leave to that. Thank you very much. And finally, we might see some rain, eh? And it's my um, pleasure to be here to give you a traditional welcome to country to the most ancient of Aboriginal land in the world here on Noongar country. And the other um, celebration that we are having is we're coming to the end of Harmony celebrations. And I would like to say that over the past week, I've um, uh, been part of quite a few um, Harmony Day celebrations and um, had to go out and buy my grannies some shirts um, to celebrate Aboriginal um, Harmony Day at their school and, and they were absolutely welcomed um, into the group. So let me welcome you here to this ancient land of Noongar, where we sit, where we camp, where we walk and where we are Buller Karajan. Wanju. Nunga Buriya Yok, Wanju Wanju, Nungas, Nunga Wom, Wedgelas, Buriyas, Nitya Yorokani Abibaman Borja, Nitya Wardangmat Management Kundam Borja, Murtjena Bidi Nitya Balapin Weir and Mitjini Ngalakan Yai Ni, Karajin and Kura Yai Buddha. Greetings, the Aboriginal custodian welcomes you all here to the land of the people of many breasts. This is Crow and Cockatoo Dreaming Land, whose families and ancestors tread the grounds, leaving footprints upon the land where their spirit lingers on, surrounding us through stories as we listen, look, learn, talk, and later on, we will celebrate. Nunakan, Kurin Kumbawad, and Pokicha Po, Nunaborja, Yual Kornicha, Beerly, Awali, Abat, Nunaborja, Wanju. Some of you may have come from over the great sea or from your land so far to come to the place of the little kangaroo rat, Wallyabup, at Bibra Lake. And I'm happy to welcome you all here today. Shuai Warawir and Buyaka, Buyaka, Muriap, Muriap, Murichuir, Nichakar, and Noriji Bornawanki. I've asked the bad spirits to leave the room and the good spirits to come and be with us. And as I hang the bunch of gum leaves, the message is I don't come in anger. I always like to share a little dreaming story. And this one is about the first sunrise. Australian Aborigines right across Australia are deeply interested in the universe about us the stars, the sky, and especially the earth. One ancient story tells of how close the sky was to the earth that everyone couldn't stand up. They had to crawl around on the ground and scratch around collecting their food with their bare hands. But Kurubaris, the magpies, decided that if they could all work together, they could raise the sky to make more room in which to move about. Slowly they raised the sky with their long sticks whilst resting on smaller boulders and then on the larger boulders until the birds could stand upright. As Kulbaris were trying to lift it even further above their camp, it suddenly split open revealing the beauty of the first sunrise. The magpies burst into their melodious call 
And as they sang, they saw the blanket of darkness break into fragments and drift away as the clouds. From those remote times until now, the magpies have always greeted the sunrise with their warbling song of incomparable beauty. And I'm sure that they are getting earlier and earlier. We are coming to the end of the season of Bunuru, nearly the end of March. It has been the time of learning about Chuit, that beautiful big tree that grows. And when the Noongars used to go and chop the wood to make their artefacts. It is also time of Kara, the racehorse Goanna. He's lovely for eating. And if you're lucky enough to catch one, there is a ceremony process to how you cook kara. When you've made that fire lovely and hot and the coals are ready to roast the meat, you have to lay him on the ground first. Now remember he's dead and you've got to tie his legs up and then you can put him on the fire because if you don't tie his legs up, he will jump up and run away even though he is dead. The other totem for this season is Pulgara, the beautiful yellow bank shear. We used to make our honey water out of it and my nana used to call it Jija water. And um, um, we still drink that honey water today. And um, I've been asked to talk about bush tucker at a, um, a group of, um, for a group of people. And I thought, you know, let's take some of our bushes that we have collected and made our bush tucker and our bush medicine into and do a presentation. And hopefully it will be a success. But let me say over the, um, over the years, I have worked here at Murdoch University, but previous to that, my grandparents used to live up where the education section of the university is. And mum would bring us up here and we would visit. But my brother Neville Collard and I, we would also be chasing the kangaroos and the emus that used to run on this land when we were little kids. And to come up here and back here at any time is very special to me. And I must say that I'm very proud to say that I have a son here that's doing um, a course in psychology and he's also attached to the Kulbadi Centre. So this area, it is traditionally the land of my grandmother's people. And as they are no longer here, it is left up to me to be responsible to do things such as welcome to countries. And it has been my pleasure to come here and do that welcome. I'm going to now leave a little blessing with you all in case we never meet here again on the ancient land of Noongar. Ngalakan Kearney Mort, Ngalakan Buller Mort, Ngalakan Buller Boy Jack Ual Kul, Yakan Ngalakundam, Doinch Doinch Warakan, Ngan. Nunuk, Ngalak, Murich Mort, Anna. Yes, we are one and we are many. And from all the lands on earth we come. We share a dream and sing with one song. I am, you are, we are solid Australians. Yonka, thank you. And let me say, go the Dockers. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Auntie Marie. I don't think I've ever heard you speak without learning something new and I'm very, very grateful for that and that you give us your time. So Michelle Andrews is the is the director of DWA and she wasn't able to be here today, but she has um, recorded a introduction message for us and she's going to introduce the project from the DWA perspective.
I acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people, the traditional owners of the land we are gathered on and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Over the past two years, I've had the privilege of supporting the state government's ambitious climate agenda, an agenda which acknowledges the urgency of taking action. This year, the state government will introduce climate change legislation to provide a framework for our response and formalise the state government's target of net zero emissions by 2050. The legislation gives greater weight to the actions needed and represents a step change in the McGowan government's efforts and the Department of Water and Environmental Regulations work to transition to a low carbon economy. We can already see the impact climate change is having on Western Australia and the world. We are seeing more extreme weather, the recent flooding in our northwest, an example, and increased bushfire risk and more frequent and severe heat waves are also occurring. The latest climate science shows these impacts are widespread, rapid and intensifying. Adapting to our harsh climatic conditions and harnessing our natural advantages has always been part of the Western Australian way of life. Whether investing in climate resilient water supplies or management of water entitlements or developing drought tolerant crops and traditional fire management practices, there are many examples of our leadership and our innovation in response to climate change. We must rapidly accelerate this action if we are to ensure that our communities, our environment and our economy adapt in a forward-looking, fair and collaborative way. Last year, the State Government released Climate Resilient WA. This document sets out core directions for delivery of a statewide climate adaptation strategy to be released later this year. It also highlights the important role of climate science in supporting ambitious and decisive actions. So it's timely to be having this conversation about the Climate Science Initiative, which will help unlock new climate insights for WA. The Climate Science Initiative showcases the power of partnerships and I thank our partner Murdoch University for hosting today. I also acknowledge our other partners, the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre and the New South Wales Government. And finally, thank you for attending today's event and for bringing your expertise to the table so that we can learn from each other and share what we know. We all have a role to play in creating a climate resilient Western Australia and it's only by working together to harness our potential that we can respond to the enormous challenge climate change presents to us all. So next I would like to um, introduce Martin Bruckner. He's here in Murdoch University in um, one of the new strategic themes for the university, which is sustainability. So he's the Pro Vice Chancellor of Sustainability at Murdoch University. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, students, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, online and here present at Bula Katagen. On behalf of university, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's West Australian Climate Science Initiative event, which Murdoch University is absolutely delighted to be hosting. As we've heard, it is a partnership, which I will speak a little bit about in just a second. Beforehand, though, in this, what I promise will be a short welcome address. I would also like to acknowledge um, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation and acknowledge their enduring culture and contribution to the vibrancy of the state. Pay my respects to all Noongar leaders, past, present, and emerging. Acknowledging also that this very place Murdoch University is situated on has been a place of learning for, mill for millennia. And uh, it's a tradition we're very proud to continue. Now, Murdoch University is very honored to be partnering with the Climate Science Initiative, which is being led, as we've heard, by Western Australia's Department of Water and Environmental Regulation. And together with Murdoch University through the New South Wales Department of Planning and the Environments and Australian Regional Climate Modelling Project and the Pawsey Supercomputer Computing Research Centre, collaboratively we are now trying to improve our understanding of climate change and the science. 
These insights, that is the intention, will better equip communities, businesses, and all levels of government to plan ahead, make better decisions for the future, develop solutions that will help protect Western Australia's unique environmental assets, and enable us to become more resilient in the face of growing climatic extremes. So for these reasons alone, this initiative is very critical, but it is also very timely. As the latest IPCC synthesis report confirms, humanity is unequivocally increasing greenhouse gas emissions to new record levels. Global temperatures are now at 1.1 degrees above pre-industrial levels and are expected to reach 1.5 degrees above in pre-industrial levels by 2030, and that these warming trends have driven and will continue to drive widespread and global changes, including sea level rise and more frequent severe weather shocks, as we've heard, and all of that will result in widespread harm to lives, livelihoods, and natural systems. The, resource, uh, the report serves also as a stark reminder that we need to take more decisive action to address this crisis and as a community, as we have also just heard, have a decisive role to play. Now we at Murdoch University, we are alive to the very dangers that climate change poses and we are committed to take action. We recognize the urgent need to reduce our carbon footprint and we are, albeit late, in the process of implementing a range of initiatives aimed at reaching carbon neutrality by 2030. So in line with our new strategic plan, these measures include investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency, working towards zero waste to landfill and encouraging sustainable transportation options. Minork University also offers a range of sustainability focused courses and research programs aimed to educate and empower students to become sustainable leaders in their future professions and communities. So through its various sustainability commitments and actions, Murdoch University is actively striving towards a more sustainable future for all. The environmental, or in the face of the current environmental state of play, we must also acknowledge, however, that opportunities have been missed in the past and continue to be missed in the mitigation space. And this very failure to listen to science explains as to why the environmental stakes have risen so sharply and why climate change is increasingly manifesting as an existential threat to humanity and many other species on this planet. Indeed, echoing the IPCC, we are now speaking of code red for planet Earth, and it's the kind of language the science community does not invoke lightly, especially in a global consensus document. So it is thus my strong hope that the Western Australian Climate Science Initiative will provide us with another opportunity to listen to and learn from the science, and that in a collaborative effort, we will be able to not only advance our understanding of climate change, but also to develop and to commit to new strategies that will help safeguard communities and their environment from the risks of unchecked anthropogenic global warming. The whole being that we begin to treat the climate crisis with the urgency it deserves. So thank you for being here today and for joining us online. And I wish you all in an insightful afternoon and productive conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, we have a lot of people online today. So um, how many have we got have up on there? Just, so just uh, to, to welcome you as well, I think 90. OK, so we've got a whole bunch of people online and we will try to make at the end much more interactive with the people that are online so that they can um, voice their uh, questions towards the end. Uh, right now, I would like to introduce Kelly Barnes. Kelly is actually going to be the program manager for this client science initiative and she is based at DWER and in the climate change division, the strategic policy and programs. Um, she's going to be responsible for managing the DWER led client science initiative in WA and she's going to give us um, a really solid background as to why this is happening now. Thank you. Thank you. And hello to everyone here in the room and also online. As we've just heard this week, the world's leading climate scientists have again highlighted the urgency of the climate crisis. And that was in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC's latest report. Despite some sobering findings, there was a message of hope. And that was that urgent action now can secure a livable future for us all. But taking this urgent action, 
and this decisive action, making good decisions, relies on the right information. This includes local level information on how our climate is changing and the associated impacts and risks. And that is why the Climate Science Initiative is so important. It will provide us with detailed local climate information tailored to Western Australia. This will help government, businesses, industry and the community understand and adapt to our changing climate. So today I'm really excited to be joined here by Dr. Jartan Kala to explain the Climate Science Initiative and how it will produce the most comprehensive West Australian climate change projections ever produced. So I hope you come away with an appreciation of the importance of this initiative, but also for an appreciation of the innovation and the robustness of what we're trying to achieve. So for those of us who have read the recent IPCC report or maybe seen it on the news, the latest, it can, well, it can feel quite overwhelming. It concludes that climate risks are escalating faster than scientists first expected. We've just heard that global temperatures are now 1.1 degrees warmer than pre-industrial levels. And without strengthening policies, this warming is projected to increase to 3.2 degrees by 2100. But what do these global trends mean for us here in Western Australia? In January 2022, Onslow reached 50.7 degrees. That is the equal hottest day on record in Australia. So how hot will it get as these temperatures continue to rise? Our southwest region has already dried out at one of the fastest rates in the world. Will that trend continue? And what do these changes mean for the most vulnerable community members, our unique biodiversity, and our infrastructure that we rely on daily. Climate models can help us answer these questions. And the latest generation of climate models that have been used to inform the IPCC report are really good at providing those global insights. But their scale is sometimes too big to examine the impacts of climate change in a specific West Australian community or region. And so to understand this, we need to translate those global climate models into regional climate models for Western Australia. And so why is this important? The need for this local information is shared by all sectors of society. That includes government, businesses, industry and community. And so on this slide, there is a, a few of the reasons of how these projections can be used. So if we look at disaster risk reduction, for example, we know that climate change is causing more severe and frequent extreme weather events like bushfires, floods and storms. Local climate projections can help agencies like the Department of Fire and Emergency Services and uh, local firefighters prepare for changing bushfire patterns. And this may include through enhanced prescribed burning practices. For our environment, local climate projections can support agencies like the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions and Aboriginal Rangers care for our care for country, our unique biodiversity and our parks and reserves. Within the energy sector, projections can support companies like Western Power and Horizon Power and the wider energy market and sector keep our power secure as our climate becomes more extreme. It can help them plan for future energy demands and prioritise the location for renewable energy projects. In agriculture, local projections, when communicated well, can help farmers choose the right crop varieties to maximise yield and manage their farm in a backdrop of changing rainfall and temperature patterns. So moving on to the Climate Science Initiative. The initiative was established in 2021. It is a state government commitment under the West Australian Climate Policy. It is producing climate change projections extending 75 years into the future, so up into the year 2100. Uh, and Dr. Jatin Kala will explain how in his presentation. But importantly, we need to translate and communicate these really large, complex climate data sets and research into a way that it can be used in decision making. 
So this includes making information available online, providing training, guidance, and this work needs to be done in consultation with relevant communities, sectors, and uh, vulnerable groups. But we also need to bring together diverse knowledges, and this includes Indigenous and local knowledges. So producing climate change projections is highly technical. It requires high performance supercomputers and significant data storage facilities. We're talking multiple terabytes of data. So in the past, these three factors have limited what we can produce. New partnerships as part of the Climate Science Initiative allow us to overcome some of these challenges and it will allow us to understand our climate like never before. So as we've heard, the Climate Science Initiative has been led by the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation and we're delivering it in partnership with the New South Wales Government and Murdoch University through a project called the New South Wales and Australian Regional Climate Modelling Project. It's a bit of a mouthful, so I often refer to it as NARCLIM, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that shortly. We've also partnered with the Pawsey Supercomputer Research Centre. So NARCLIM is led by the New South Wales Government Department of Planning and Environment. They have been producing local scale climate projections for southeastern Australia for over a decade. Last year, Western Australia, through the Climate Science Initiative, joined the project. NARCLIM has now grown to be a collaboration between four jurisdictions, New South Wales, ACT, South Australia and Western Australia, as well as two research institutions, Murdoch University and the University of New South Wales. The NARCLIM partnership allows us to create consistent climate data stretching from Sydney to Perth. It has also helped us reduce duplication and boost our climate science capability. This is really important because right now across Australia, there is a patchwork of climate data sets. And we know this makes it really difficult for people to access, compare and use the data. And if you're an organisation with a national footprint, it can be even more challenging for you to understand your risks to your operations and your assets. So by joining forces with other jurisdictions and Australia's research community, we can ensure that we provide the best available climate science information in a consistent way. Another way that we are supporting this ambition is by joining the new National Partnership for Climate Projections. This partnership aims to develop a consistent approach to, the deliver, to deliver comparable and fit for purpose climate information. And if you want to learn more about this, uh, there was a Climate Projections Roadmap for Australia published just a few weeks ago, and it's available online. You can have a look at. So moving on to our partnership with Murdoch University. Our partnership with Murdoch means that we've teamed up with local climate scientists who understand WA's unique climate features. Our multidisciplinary team consists of program managers, science communicators, modelers and climate scientists. We also want to support and invest in the next generation of climate scientists and ensure that we further build this capability here in Western Australia. So that's why our partnership with Murdoch will support two PhD scholarships. Two weeks ago, you may have seen in the news, the Minister for Environment and Climate Action, the Honourable Rhys Whitby, announced that our new climate projections will be produced using one of the world's most powerful and greenest supercomputers based here in Perth. As I previously mentioned, computer power and data storage has often limited what can be produced. So by partnering with the Pawsey Supercomputing Research Centre and using their newest supercomputer called Centenix, we have access to the data processing that we need to produce the most reliable view of WA's future climate. The Climate Science Initiative is proud to be one of the largest projects using Centenix to date. And if you don't know, Centenix is the scientific name for Quokka, and its capabilities are truly extraordinary. It takes just one second to do a calculation that would take a human 1.5 billion years to achieve. Its power is equivalent to hundreds of thousands of standard computers working together. It's also the fourth greenest supercomputer in the world. 
This means that we can undertake this high impact research with a lower environmental impact. So our project has now commenced on Centenix and Jartan will explain how this work um, is operating. But I thought I'd just let you know of some of the next steps. The first projections are expected to be available uh, for climate scientists in 2024. And the reason I said this is there's a lot of data and we know that this is going to need to be analysed and processed for use by a broader audience. And this is really important. It's a big task and we'll be rolling it out progressively. And at the moment, we're just at the start. So today I'm just going to give you a quick sense of what some of these products might look like as we continue to develop our thinking. So we know how important it is that we translate this data to allow non-technical users to understand and apply it and use it in decision making. So this could include through visualisation products and web content. So up on the screen, there's an example of the um, visualisation product that Victorian government has, the New South Wales ADAPT website and the Australian Climate Change in Projections website. We're really fortunate that we can learn from and work with other jurisdictions to make sure that we can present our information in the best way possible to enhance the user experience. And this is also a key focus of the National Partnership for Climate Projections. We also know, we also know uh, that we need a way for technical users and the research community to be able to access the data. And so we're looking at options for data portals and ways for um, technical reports and scientific papers uh, to outline what we are doing and why it's important and how to access it. So finally, just a few key takeaways from me. I'm really excited that we are producing the most comprehensive local climate change projections for Western Australia, extending to the year 2100. These projections will help West Australians understand the risks and also the opportunities of our changing climate at a very local level. We are partnering with a team of world leading climate scientists and using one of the most powerful supercomputers on the planet to do this work. Another reason why this is exciting to me is that we're taking this work is taking place in Western Australia by West Australian scientists and institutions, but in collaboration with partners right across the country. Our methodology aligns with national and international best practice and will work to create consistent data across Australia. So as I've mentioned, we're still in the early stages of this project but we're really excited to be sharing some of this information with you today. If you'd like to stay updated, please join our mailing list. Uh, and I'm now pleased to introduce Dr. Jartan Kala, our lead climate scientist on the project. Jartan has been working with climate models and supercomputers for more than a decade. Today, he's gonna to provide a short overview of how the climate projections are being produced and the innovation that this team is applying is really exciting. So I hope you enjoy hearing about the process. And I, I look forward to continuing this discussion in the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for your introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone in the room and everyone else um, who's online. I'm really thrilled to have such a good turnout to this event. So my name is Jatin Kala. I'm a senior lecturer at Murdoch University. And in my talk today, I will be talking about the nitty gritty of what we are doing, what it means. Next slide. So <clears throat> this is a, a little outline of my talk. I will just spend one slide explaining why this is actually happening at Murdoch University. I'll then move on to talk about why we actually need um, this process of dynamical downscaling. So as Kelly explained, we have these global models, but they are very coarse and we can't use them directly to inform policy at the regional scale. The process of taking a global model and turning it into regional information is called dynamical downscaling. And as you can imagine, we are not the only group in Australia or in the world doing this work. This is done internationally at many different research institutions. So there's actually a very well coordinated 
um, international community which coordinates all of these activities and comes up and, and they come up with methodologies that everyone needs to abide by. So I will explain that a bit. Um, that will then flow on to the New South Wales project, why it's important within that international framework and then how we fit in and what we will actually do. So why, why is this happening with, um, why, why is this collaboration happening at Murdoch University and not a different university? Um, my group at Murdoch has been very active in this field. As Kelly mentioned, we've got more than 30 papers and counting, which make use of these regional models, right? Um, the, the, the model that will be used to produce these projections is one I've used for more than a decade. And as Kelly mentioned already, Murdoch University is already a partner with the New South Wales government. And that partnership started already a year and a half to two years ago. So Murdoch has already been on the national scene, helping the New South Wales government deliver its project. So we, we are already involved. That involves myself and um, the senior postdoc on the project, Dr. Julia Andres, who is also one of my previous PhD students and a, a Murdoch alumni. I was also lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 1.5 degree global warming report. So, so I know about this stuff. Um, okay, so what are global climate models? Right, so we, we need to know how the climate will change in the future across the globe. So we cover the globe in this computational grid, this mesh, and at each of these boxes, a whole bunch of equations are solved. These, equa these equations govern how mass is conserved in the atmosphere, how, um, how um, uh, water transforms from liquid to gas to ice, right? They could, they, these equations allow us to simulate what's happening across the globe in a dynamical sense. It's based on mass and physics. So that's all nice and good. These models are really good at telling us what happens across the globe and they're really good at simulating global weather patterns. But we are interested in Western Australia. So what does the southwest of Western Australia look like in one of these models? So the plot on the left-hand side is the topography in a typical global climate model, right? You can see the big rectangles. Each of these rectangles is one of these boxes where we do the math. So you can see in a, in a global climate model, we don't resolve topography properly. The coast is very rugged. Um, you can't see the Darling Scar, for example. On the other hand, in our four kilometer regional climate model setup, which is the plot on the right hand side, you look at this plot and you can tell this is the southwest of Western Australia. You can see the Darling Scar we can actually see that in this model, we will resolve topographical effects on weather and climate properly. Next slide. Something else which is critical is land use, right? In these models, at each of these grid points, what does the model think is the dominant land use type? Does the model think there's agriculture happening? Does the model think there's forests? Does the model think it's bare soil, right? So on the left-hand side is land use in a global climate model. All you have to understand is that each color is a different dominant land use type. So in, in and that's actually the Australian Global Climate Model Access ESM. So over the southwest of Western Australia in that model, there's only four types of land use. Really, there's only three, right? But we know that our land use in the real world is a lot more heterogeneous. So on the right hand side, I'm showing you the land use in our regional climate model. And very clearly, you can see the wheat belt region in green. You can see the shrublands um, to the east of, of the rabbit proof fence in, in yellow. You can see the tall forests along the southwest coast. So in these regional models, we resolve the real world as it is a lot better than in these global models. 
Something else that has huge impacts and that brings all of the rainfall we get in our region of storms. We get storm tracks happening. This is a picture taken, I believe, at Kuji Beach, not far from here. And you can see this, this, uh, this line of clouds moving in and the rain associated with it. Now, imagine a, a, a grid box in a global climate model that represents 150 to 250 kilometers of the Earth, right? Now think about this storm, right? This storm occurs on a spatial scale, which is significantly smaller than 150 to 250 kilometers. So these global models don't, they can't really resolve um, convective storms very well. So that has to be approximated. So that's why we need them. Okay, so how does dynamical downscaling using these regional climate models work? So on the left hand side, you have um, the whole globe as seen by a, a global climate model or reanalysis. I'll explain what that is a bit later on. Now, these models have resolutions of 150 to 250 kilometers. What we do in dynamical downscaling using regional models is that we take a big area from the global model, right? A big boundary of, a, of the region of interest. We take data at the boundary of this, at this boundary shown in red, and that data is then fed into a regional model. The regional model in principle works in, in very similar ways to the global model. In the regional model, rather than having 150 kilometer grids, you have four kilometer grids, right? At, at the finest scale. And at each of these grid points, we solve a whole bunch of equations of math and physics. Now, we want to produce projections at four kilometers, but the global model comes at 150 to 250 kilometers. You can't jump from 150 to 250 kilometers to four kilometers in one shot that the system will break. It doesn't work like that. The math doesn't won't allow you to do that. How do we do that? It needs to be done in steps. So the first step is to go to 20 kilometers. So you see on the, on the plot on the right hand side, there's this dotted rectangle covering Australia, some of the tropics and New Zealand, and it says 20 kilometers. So that's the, what we call the coarse uh, resolution domain. And then information from that 20 kilometer grid then feeds into smaller grids. And there's one four kilometer grid over the Southeast and one four kilometer grid over the Southwest. So that's how this works at, at a very high level. Now, as I mentioned, this type of work doesn't happen in isolation. People all around the globe in different parts of the world need to do a very similar thing for their region of interest. So climate scientists all around the globe via the World Climate Research Program, the WCRP, have come together and made up something called CODEX. All CODEX is, it's an international effort to coordinate dynamical downscaling activities worldwide. Why is this important? It's really important because we don't want groups all around the world doing their own thing. And then a couple of years later coming saying, oh, I've done this and someone else has done something else and it's not comparable, right? We also, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to share knowledge. This is the whole point behind Codex and it's a really important initiative. Next slide. So one of the things that Codex does is define key regions of the globe, right? So if anyone, any climate scientist is interested in doing regional projections for Australia, the CODEX protocol says that if you're gonna do anything over Australia, we want you to cover this region as shown by this map here. So we want you to cover that box that covers Australia. Why is this? It's because if say, two different universities uh, or two different research organizations, or even someone in a different country wants to simulate climate of Australia, they are all gonna use the same domain. That means that when they publish their results, we can easily compare the two. Because if everyone does their own thing, it's gonna be a dog's breakfast at the end, right? 
All right, so Australasia is a predefined codex domain. And the, the resolution of that domain needs to be between 25 and 12.5 kilometers. So before you do any dynamical downscaling, the, um, sorry, you skipped too many. Um, can you go back up? Yep. So before you do dynamical downscaling, the first question you need to ask yourself is who is already doing this, right? Who in Australia is already simulating the entire Australian region, right? Because we don't want to repeat that exactly the same way if someone is already doing it, right? That would be duplication. All right, so who is doing that? Next slide. Turns out the New South Wales government is doing that, right? So we don't need to duplicate what they are already doing. And as I, Kelly and I both mentioned before, Murdoch has been a partner with the New South Wales government to help them deliver their latest pro uh, uh, projections. So hence why we have a very, very strong partnership with the New South Wales government, because we don't want to go and repeat the same thing again. So this is what the New South Wales government is doing, right? They are already simulating um, regional climate over the whole continent at 20 kilometer resolution, right? That's sh shown by the dotted, that dotted uh, rectangular shape, right? Everything inside we're simulating. And then because it's the New South Wales government, of course, their highest resolution domain, the four kilometer do domain, which is embedded within the 20 kilometer domain is over Southeast Australia. Right, makes sense. That's uh, the new, you know, uh, New South Wales taxpayers' money is going into do to, to 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 fund that. Right. Okay. So what are we going to do? So logically, we thought, well, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Therefore, we will use the Cordex Australasia 20 20 kilometer model outputs already being generated by the New South Wales government. So we will use that as input, and then we will run a four kilometer domain over Southwest WA. One thing, and I will touch on this later on, for now we're just doing four kilometers over the Southwest because we, we need to start with what we can manage. But just remember that the rest of the continent is covered by the 20 kilometer, 20 kilometer domain. There's also um, sibling projects led by the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology and the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology are running different models, but they are also simulating the Codex Australia domain, right? So in a couple of years time, there will be a whole bunch of data sets covering the whole of Australia and limited data sets at high resolution for Southeast and Southwest Western Australia. Yep, next slide. So why this approach, as Kelly mentioned, we want to be nationally consistent and comparable we want to avoid duplication. We want to leverage work and investment already on the way. And we want to align with the national ambitions for the production of climate projections for the whole country, right? We don't want to do our own thing. So now, what are we actually going to do? The project has two phases, and this is where it will start getting a bit jargony and technical, but, but bear with me. Okay. So as I mentioned before, Codex is the umbrella organization that provides the guidelines. When you go and read Codex guidelines, you want to do regional climate modeling, you go and read the guidelines. What is the first thing they tell you to do? The first thing they tell you to do is this, right? So as required by Codex, we will first run four kilometer simulations of the Southwest Western Australia with inputs from something called ERA-5 reanalysis. That will simulate past climate only from 1979 to 2022. The point of this first simulation is that it establishes the benchmark simulation of the skill of the model in simulating past weather and climate as close as we possibly can. Now, uh, next slide. Now, what are reanalysis data sets? And what is special about this ERA-5 reanalysis that the Codex community tells us to use this one and not something else? All right, next slide. So what are reanalyses? So we know that observations are very limited. This plot here 
shows you locations of bureau meteorology stations where there's long-term high quality controlled temperature data, right? So there's not a lot of very, very good quality temperature records. Of course, we're not limited by weather stations. We also have satellite data. We have weather balloon data. We have data from ships. We have data from planes. We have all sorts of data sets. But still, we cannot measure everything everywhere all the time. We just can't. So what can we do? What, well, we, we also do something else, right? So weather forecasting agencies all around the globe, the Bureau of Meteorology, the US system, the Europeans, they are all running numerical weather prediction models, right? So the Bureau of Meteorology runs the access model to try to work out what's going to happen tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, next week, and the week after. So what happens is we, we, seem, we try to predict the weather a few weeks into the future. Then that time actually elapses and we know what really happened in the real world based on our entire observational network. What is a reanalysis? A reanalysis combines these two things together. So we have models that have tried to predict what's going to happen in the next hour, the next two hours, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow and so forth for about two weeks. And then we have observations of what really happened in the real world over that time period. Guess what we do? We then combine the two together. And that is what a reanalysis stands for. A reanalysis is a combination of weather forecasting models and best available observations to reproduce the weather and climate as close as possible to what really happened in the real world. Right? It's highly, highly constrained, but it only applies to the past because we don't have observations of the future. All right. So now this is what a reanalysis is. What is ERA-5 reanalysis? Why are we using that one? So many reanalysis data sets exist, but ERA-5 is the most state-of-the-art, highest resolution, covers the whole globe at 30 kilometers. It's available for free at hourly frequency from 1979 to present. They have recently pulled it back. I think now you can get it from 1950 to present. It's produced by the Europeans. They are the world leaders in that, and that's why everyone uses their product, right? So the main reason why Codex protocols say you need to do this first is because this is the best reanalysis around. Next slide. So part one of this project and these simulations are running as we speak on Posi. So we will deliver four kilometer resolution ERA-5 driven simulations for Southwest WA. And that will provide a highly valuable climatology of the observed weather and climate from 1979 to present. What does this mean? Let's say that you might be interested in say that hail event that happened in 2010 that caused a lot of damage. Our simulations will capture that hail event the way it happened, like to the best we possibly can. If you're interested in a particular cold front that happened last year that, you know, bucketed down a whole bunch of rain and you want to study that even in more detail, it will be in our simulations. You want to study about a heat wave event, right? We had uh, four or five days above 40, um, not, not, not for, um, recently, last year. If you wanted to, to look at that in more detail, you can do this using these simulations, right? So think of these simulations as the best we could possibly achieve in simulating the past. But this cannot tell us anything directly about the future. Sure, you can look at trends from these simulations and extrapolate, but it won't tell you anything directly about the future. How do we find out about the future? This is where CMIP-6 global climate models comes, come in, right? So this now forms part two of the project. Again, this is all following the international protocols. So what will we do? We will run what we call CMIP-6 driven simulations of both past and future climate. Over the past, what we call the historical period is 1950 to 2015. The future starts from 2015 to 2100, 
and we will simulate two possible future climates, one called SSP126, the other one called SSP370. I know this is very jargon heavy, so I'm going to explain what is SIMIP6, what are these SSPs, and you're probably wondering when 2023, why, is, why does the future start in 2015, right? So I will explain that, don't worry. Okay, so what is CMIP6? Okay, CMI, CMIP stands for Coupled Model Intercomparison Inter Project. The six stands for the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You probably heard of the synthesis report from the IPCC AR6 that came out recently. That report made use of what we call CMIP6 models. All it means, all CMIP6 means, is the latest, most advanced global climate models that humankind has produced to now, right? That, that, that's what it means. Now, we have CMIP6 simulations of the historical climate, and then we need to work out what happens in the future. What happens in the future depends on climate policy. There's many different possibilities. These different future climates are defined by what we call shared socioeconomic pathways called SSPs, right? Next slide. So what are these shared socioeconomic pathways? So usually when I teach this in my courses, I spend a whole lecture about this, but I will just summarize it very quickly here, right? So there's um, five SSPs. All they mean are just possible future climates. What is shown on this graph here is from the IPCC AR6 Working Group 1 Summary for Policymakers, and all it shows is the, the observed change in the global surface temperature relative to 1850 to 1900, so that's the black bit. And then once we are 2015, we have these five different lines. Each of these lines is a different future possible climate. You will see that it goes from SSP1 to SSP5, right? Okay, so there's five families of SSPs. SSP1 is where we the whole world transitions to renewable energy, like right now. It is the best case. SSP5 is a scenario where we burn every piece of coal we can find in the ground. We basically burn all the fossil fuels that we could possibly get our hands on. We just burn the whole lot, right? Okay, so these are your two extremes. And what is shown here is the amount of global warming you will get depending on these different scenarios. You will notice that there's actually a second number. So there's SSP1, 1.9, SSP1, 2.6, SSP2, 4.5, et cetera, et cetera. The second number, the 1.9, the 2.6, 4.5, 7.0, and 8.5, that refers to a radiative forcing in watts per meter squared. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but basically the bigger the number, the more warming there is. Okay, so next slide. So based on the latest projections, right, we are heading anywhere between 2.1 degrees and 3.5 degrees global warming by 2100. That's where we think, based on current policy, we might end up. So if we look at that range, um, we see that SS, the SSP1 2.6 and the SSP3 7.0 covers this range of warming. That's the reason why most modeling groups are primarily focusing on SSP1 2.6 and SSP3 7.0 as the envelope. The reason why, you might be wondering, why are you not running SSP5 8.5 is because, thank God, we are actually not burning all the coal in the ground. Right, so, so next slide. So following the Codex protocols and the New South Wales project, we will run CMIP6 simulations for the historical period, so 1950 to 2014, that will have the observed greenhouse gas forcing behind it. And then we'll run two future scenarios, SSP1 2.6 and SSP3 7.0 from 2015 to 2100. The future starts in 2015, because as you can imagine, even though the IPCC AR6 report came out this year, 
the modeling groups around the world were scrambling to get started many, many years before because it takes he heaps of time to, produce, to run these simulations, right? So that's why 2015 counts as the future because when these model simulations were designed and run, it was quite a few years ago. That's the reason behind it. Okay, so now I've talked about what future scenarios we're going to simulate, but there are many, many, many CIMIP6 global models. Lots of them. You can't downscale all of them, right? We just don't have the compute for that, and you don't want to do that anyway. So we think we can manage five, right, as an Australian community. So which five global models of the CIMIP6 family are we going to downscale to four kilometers? So a lot of work has already been done on which five models the Australian community will pick. And that's been published by uh, DVHLO et al. 2021. So I'm just going to go through that very quickly. So what did we do? DVHLO et al. looked at all of the CMIP6 models, the whole lot. And then we, they simply rejected models that simulate Australian climate poorly. You don't want to use these. And then we also want to use models that simulate the full range of possible future climates. Not all modeling groups manage to simulate every SSP out there. We also want to make sure the models are independent. You don't want to choose two models to downscale when these two models you know beforehand have very similar climate change signals, right? You want to sample models that actually give you slightly different answers because if you pick models which are statistically very similar to each other you're just going to get the same answer we don't want that we want to sample the variability and of course just because a model is good just because it's independent doesn't mean you can use it because of many technical reasons not all modeling groups will will output all the variables we need to run our model so right sometimes there's a fantastic model we really want to downscale it Turns out that modeling group did not save some key variables we absolutely need, so we can't use it. That just happens. Okay, so how did that have, How did that work? So on this plot here, um, this is showing um, the skill of CMIP6 models in simulating the annual mean maximum temperature of Australia. The very, very first plot on the top left-hand side, which says AWAP, AWAP, that's the observed mean annual maximum temperature in degrees Kelvin, right? All of the other plots uh, follow that blue to red scale. This is simply model minus observations. Put simply, if a model shows up as a lot of red, it means that that model simulates too warm maximum temperatures. If it shows up as a lot of blue, it means that model runs too cold. So ideally, we want to pick models which are in the very pale blue or very pale red, so near zero. And then we did the same thing for precipitation. This is the same thing, except it's showing annual mean precipitation. It's the same idea. You don't want to pick models which show a lot of blue. These models tend to simulate way too much rain over Australia. Models which are very much in brown simulate too little rain over Australia, right? So this allows us to, 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 to just check out the models which don't do a very good job over our continent. And then, next slide. And then what we do, we do as climate scientists, we produce these quite complicated figures, but actually they're quite simple. Basically, what we want to do with these, this type of analysis, right? you don't have to understand the intricacies of it, but basically, you see, you can think of these graphs as having four quadrants. You don't want to pick models that are very close to each other. So next slide. So which is why we ended, so the Australian climate community based on this analysis, pick the five models which are shown in blue here. Because these models, you will see that they sample the quadrants quite nicely. You don't want too many models in one spot only. So based on this analysis, these are the five CMIP6 global models that we're going to downscale. So what will that produce? This will produce four kilometer resolution simulations. 
downscaling five CMIP-6 global models under historical climate, again, 1940 to 2014, future climate under two possible scenarios, SSP-126, SSP-370, from 2015 to 2100. Now, I, want, I need to stress here that the point of these simulations is not to try to figure out exactly what the weather will be, say, on the 1st of July 2051 at, Murdo at the Murdoch University campus. That's not what these models are designed for. What we use these models for is to look at long-term trends, average of at least uh, min usually a minimum of 10 years, the, the standard usually is 30 years. So these simulations will allow us to examine changes in climatology relative to the historical simulations. Now, unlike the ERA-5 simulations in part one, these simulations of historical climate do not incorporate any observations at all in them. They are not constrained at all. We just let the model run. Why do we do that? Because we don't have observations in the future. If you want to compare the future with the past, the simulations have to be run in a consistent way, right? So these simulations don't know anything about observations. So what we will deliver, again, just to reiterate, part one of the project will deliver what we call ERA-5 reanalysis driven simulations. These will relate directly to observed weather and climate. You can actually pinpoint something that happened at a particular point in time at a particular place, and you can question the model. You can question the outputs we produce. That doesn't tell us about the future, which is why part two exists. Part two does both past climate and future climate in a consistent way. But with part two, what you're looking at is what happens in the future minus what's happened in the past. So it will allow us to ask questions such as, what's the winter, you know, by the time we reach 2050, what does winter rainfall look like on average? What do summer temperatures look like on average? How does the statistics of heat waves change? They become more intense if yes, by how much, by how many degrees? Do they last longer by how many days? We can answer all of these questions. Next part. Um, the regional climate model we're going to use, the main tool, has been extensively tested in simulating climate of Australia. We've done a lot of work on that. Because that model itself has its own intricacies, we're actually going to run two different configurations of the same model. They're just going to use slightly different ways of calculating what happens in the atmosphere, slightly different methods. They're going to be the same resolution, cover the same area, everything is the same. These two model configurations, as you can imagine, we've done a lot of work in identifying the two that work the best. So all of this work is currently being written up to be published and submitted for publication soon. Everything we do, so for the ERA-5 and the CMIP-6 historical simulations, will of course be evaluated against observations. So if you want to use this data, you will be able to find a paper which shows you the evaluation. So you will know what sort of model skill you're looking at. Um, we will produce basically what this means. Model output variables will be consistent with codex variable lists. That pretty much means any variable you would expect out of a climate model, we will we will be producing it, right? So the codex community has come up with a whole bunch of variables that they think most people want, and we're going to produce all of them. So chances are, if you need something, we we will have it. Um, there's, sorry, can you go back? There's other uh, indices that people are interested in that, for example, Codex doesn't require. Um, so fire danger. So when you, when you um, every day, right, there's a fire danger rating. How is that calculated? It's calculated based on a whole bunch of meteorological variables and the dryness of the fuel. Turns out we can calculate a similar index from our model output. So we can produce a whole bunch of fancy indices that are useful to different people. So data delivery is under planning, but it will look very similar to what already exists. Next one, what we will not deliver. So this is not a weather forecasting or a seasonal forecasting project. We're not gonna tell you what's happening next week. We are not gonna tell you what's happening next year. That is called seasonal forecasting. It's a different area completely. 
And actually, if anyone is interested, I actually have a student who is doing exactly that, right? So we can talk about this another day. There are some limitations for people who are interested about the ocean. That the models we run have a dynamic land and atmosphere, but we don't have a dynamic ocean. The reason behind that is running dynamic land ocean atmosphere is very complicated, produces so much data, requires so much compute power that we, we try to keep it simple. So in our simulations, um, sea surface temperatures from the driving model, so that's either ERA-5 or CMIP-6, are interpolated in space and time and provided to the model as input, right? So we are not simulating changes in coastal oceanography. That is given to the model. The, the model sees the surface sea surface temperature. Having said all of that, people who run ocean models on their own without a dynamic atmosphere will be able to use what we produce to run their ocean models after we finish our work. So, so that 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 can happen. What are we going to do this year? We, we're getting things set up. So the five global models that were picked, they were picked with a national focus, right? We, they, we looked at the whole continent, but we know that there's particular weather features that affect Western Australia more than the Eastern states. These are things like the West Coast Trough, these blocking highs in the Great Australian Bight, which bring the, the hot easterly winds in. We have uh, these fronts coming in winter, right? So we actually, because we have picked these five models, we actually want to know in a bit more detail how they simulate these weather features that matter more to Western Australia than the Eastern states. So that is happening at the moment. We're in a complete phase one, uh, this year, that's the ERA-5 simulations, and get all of the CMIP-6 historical simulations running stably. So there's there's a, there's a lot. We're handling millions of files, terabytes and terabytes of data. So there's a lot that goes behind it. Now, I know I've been talking a lot, but what I want you to take out of this talk is this is the very, very first time we are producing four kilometer projections for the Southwest. We're downscaling five models, two future scenarios, all the way to 2100. Everything multiplied by two because we have two model setups. No, we ha no one has ever done this much for this state ever. Whatever I've done in the past has been a fraction of this due to limited resources. This is the very, very, very first time a Western Australian university has partnered with Dua and the Posey Center to work hand in hand to deliver this. So this is really big. Uh, the project has data sharing at its heart, as Kelly explained. All the work I've done before, you would only know about it if you read my paper and if you knew me and we were in the same community, right? And that's the way it's been for many groups in the past. With this project, this is gonna change drastically. Everything we produce will be available via portals. And, and, and these portals will not only have what we've produced, will have also what other groups have produced, right? So this is a really, it's a big game changer. Right now, there is no ADAPT WA website, the same way as the ADAPT New South Wales website, right? And, and hopefully we will deliver something like that uh, at the end of the project. I know I've talked a lot here and there was a lot of jargon. Over the next couple of months, we're actually gonna write a technical report which will explain everything I've talked about today in a lot of detail, right? So, um, and we will distribute that as widely as we can. Throughout the project, we'll be writing papers, submit them, submitting that to journals. So you will have a reference if anyone wants to use this data set. We, the initial focus in the, on the Southwest, because we need to bite what we can chew, we, and that's what we can manage right now. We acknowledge that the Northwest is a very important region and we are currently working out how possibly we could run a Northwest domain as well. We right now are only planning to run two scenarios, SSP 126 and SSP 370. Uh, based on what we hear from stakeholders, there's a lot of interest in SSP 245. SSP 245 is midway between SSP 126 and SSP 370. So, we are, we are planning, we're thinking ahead on how we can deliver more than what I've just presented today. And uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you.
So we've just got the QR code up there for those who are wanting to um, go onto the mailing list to learn more about the project when the report comes out and these things that Jartan and Kelly have been speaking about. So jump onto that QR code to um, get onto the mailing list. Thank you. We've got a question here that's about the choice of the baseline. Um, I think that it was sort of explained in quite a lot of detail, but the question is that the long-term data does not support the hypothesis that increases in carbon dioxide levels lead to reduction in rainfall in the southwest of Western Australia. And so given these serious abnormalities, how credible are the model's results? I think this is a question for you, Jatin. I'm not allowed to stand slightly on the question. I think if you don't read the book, I should have presented data which supports the question. I'll, I'll answer that question. Um, we've um, we have long-term observations of rainfall along Southwest WA, and there is a long-term decline in winter rainfall. Um, not just me, but a whole bunch of people have tried their very best to attribute what is causing the decline in rainfall. And that is um, the, the vast majority of the climate models show that the decline in winter rainfall is strongly linked to greenhouse gas emissions, especially along the southwest coast. Now, Frank, I know you sent me some data that doesn't show these trends. I don't know where the data is from, whether it's quality controlled, but you can't just pick one random station that doesn't show um, a, a declining rainfall trend and disclaim the science behind it. This is the launch of the WA Climate Initiative Program. Frank, I, I emailed you a paper published in a journal that did not involve me, where they did exactly that. They reconstructed southwest Western Australia rainfall going back hundreds of years using paleoclimate data, and they come to the conclusion that greenhouse gas forcing explains a large part of the decline in winter rainfall, right? So we would like to see your analysis published in the literature and peer-reviewed like everyone else does. Thank you. Okay. So we have a question here from Meredith Guthrie. <laughs> asking, do you have a time frame of when the data will be available and any chance that this might be in an API for programs? Yes, hi Meredith. Hello. Uh, so our current estimates is that the climate projection simulations that Jartan have started working on will run through till next year but that is going to be a large amount of data. The process of turning, uh, checking that data, analysing it and turning it into trends that we can then put on the website, unclear exactly those timeframes, but we are working with others and we can certainly provide more information over the course of the year. Like we said, we're just at the start, so I don't have exact deadlines and timeframes for you. Thank you. And if if anyone is really, 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 really wants some data from us um, and and you know what to do with it, you can always email me and we can see what we can do. But the actual delivery via portal, I think will take quite a bit of time. But but if you you know you really, really, really want the data and the portal isn't there yet, we can probably work something out within reason. So here's um, another question from in the room. Um, it's, is there any reason why the future projections are for 75 years and have there, is there any choice about the 50 to 100? I think the 50 is captured in the 75, but is there any thought of going further? 
Yeah, look, I think it's um, the, the reason to stop at 2100 is a bit of a pragmatic one and um, also not very many modeling groups go beyond 2100. So even if you wanted to, we don't really have the data for it. And and in terms of planning, that's the sort of time scale I think policy is being developed on. So it's I think it's kind of a pragmatic choice more than anything else. And I think that's just recognising that we have heard from some stakeholders, particularly those in the infrastructure industry who are looking to create really large projects that might have a life beyond that, that having that data would be useful. But as Jartan said, um, we're working with the best we've got and we can always um, keep an eye out for new advancements as they happen. Thank you. So there's a really good question here is what other differences in the modelling done between seasons, i.e. for the next year, versus the modelling that you've been doing for the longer term? Yeah. So, okay, so with seasonal forecasting, um, we're trying to predict next year. So how do we do that? So the Bureau has its seasonal forecasting model. Um, and we... And that is mostly we we run the model like we you're kind of um, trying to simulate weather up to one year in advance, but the way that works is they are not quite trying to figure out what happens, you know, on this day next year. They are what they are trying to work on is what is the likelihood of having below median rainfall or above median rainfall below median maximum temperature, above median maximum temperature. And it's usually over quite a long time period over like, okay, so June, July, August next year, just so farmers can plan, what confidence do we have that's gonna be above or below median rainfall? What plays a big role in that, especially in the Eastern states, is we look at teleconnections with the large scale modes of variability. What does that mean? So we might, for example, in these, seasonal forecast, they will look very strongly at are we in an El Nino year, a La Nina year or a neutral year and how strong is that phase because that will largely dictate the sort of rainfall you get over say Southeast Australia. So they look at these links as well. With what we are doing, um, in, in theory in these simulations, you could pretend you could, we, we're going to have outputs for the year 2024, right? That's going to be produced. But you should never look at the outputs for the 2024 from what we will produce as a prediction of exactly what will happen in the year 2024. What you can do is you can say, okay, this is the, in the year 2024, this is the average rainfall in June, July, August. How does that compare, for example, to the past 30 years that you can do, right? But, but so I, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So we've got a couple here that are sort of linked to each other. And again, it's about data and data availability. So it's when um, the question is, will the era five reanalysis data be available in 2024 or earlier? What are you thinking? I think that's one for you, Kelly. Yeah, um, look, the hope is the era five simulations will be done this year and we will have written up a big chunk of it and submitted it. Ideally, we want the paper published before we share the data. Um, so you actually have a reference if you're going to use that data. So it's, yeah, it, it, it's hard to tell right now, but as I mentioned before, if, if you really, really want the data, like you can always drop me an email and we can, we can work something out. But my hope is pending, you know, the supercomputer gods being kind to us and our models running stably, um, it, it will be done this year. The, the delivery of this amount of data um, is certainly something that every jurisdiction and the Commonwealth are all trying to look at right now. We know and we hear from all of our stakeholders how important it is. It is such large data sets that we know that most people can't 
use them meaningfully, but also it is very, very costly to be having them downloaded and um, using lots and lots. So we're trying to just work out our ways using what we've learnt from other jurisdictions, including the New South Wales government with their data portal. Uh, and we will um, do our best to kind of keep you updated and you can sign up to that mailing list so we can provide those updates. Uh, but it's a big, big task. I would probably come to say that it's something that in Australia we we haven't quite got right yet. So we are still learning, we are still sharing, um, and there's going to probably be some opportunities to help shape how these look in some consultation further in the year. Okay, thank you. And and there was a second question on to that one is you're going to be um, doing a whole lot of model, like you're doing five scenarios, is it five scenarios? And but two scenarios, five models, will they all be available in the end? And the answer to that is yes as well. So um, we've got a question from online. This one seems incredibly technical to me, um, so I hope I get it right. It says, can you please explain Barra PH or a CSIRO product being used in the era, in part one, era five? Okay, so Barra is a reanalysis data set that's produced by the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. Barra PH, I believe, stands for Barra Perf, which is high resolution over Perf. I, I can't recall off the top of my head what the, re the re resolution is. So um, people interested in, uh, so what, to answer that question, so Barra does not, is not part of ERA 5, they're separate things. The reason we use ERA-5 and not BARA is because BARA is only over Australia, it's not the whole globe. ERA-5 is over the whole globe, which is why Codex says use ERA-5, don't use a data set that is only available to you in your country alone and only covers your country. Having said all of that, it would be actually a very good exercise to compare what we produce with the BARA reanalysis. Is it better, worse? How does it come? How do they complement each other? So I think this is something we probably should look at. Yep. Sorry, I've been asking the questions without saying people's names. So I apologize for that. I should have been um, giving the names. I'll do that from here on in. Um, and I acknowledge everyone that's asked a question so far, but I've I won't go back over them. Um, this is a question from Fiona Scarf. It's about what re are the, is there a regional model available currently for the Southwest at a low, lower res resolution or is there still the only the older data available? The low resolution. I can move it. Yeah. <laughs> the best available data that we have at the moment that you can access is on the Australian Climate Change in Australia website. That data was produced in 2015 by CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology. That provides five kilometre resolution data. Uh, and what they have done is grouped up the data into regions. So there is a um, Southern Australia uh, report. There's one for the rangelands and one for the monsoonal north. Um, yep. Is there anything else? Yeah, there is um, something we are currently working on at the moment, which is We've got 10 kilometer resolution over Southwest WA, but that's downscaling one CMIP5 GCM, so not CMIP6, it's an older version. And we are currently writing that up and to hopefully submit it to a journal later this year. So um, I'm more than happy to facilitate access to that data set that follows, so if this gets technical, I know, but this follows RCP 4.5 and 8.5 which is the CMIP5 terminology for future climate scenarios. But yeah, so I've got some stuff which is not in public yet. Uh, if people are interested in CMIP5 projections, but for CMIP6, for this project, you have to wait a bit. I've got another question about the um, sort of the historical data. So this is from um, John Clark from Forestry Australia. He wants to know why exactly is the historical data starting virtually yesterday, which is in 1950, um, instead of, I guess, back further in time? Uh, did, yeah. So why does it start 1950 instead of, I don't know. 
Ah, oh, right, right. So for the historical period, why does it start in 1950 and not earlier, right? So, okay, so that goes back to the Codex framework, right? So we, we want to do dynamical downscaling and we need global climate modeling groups to, to, to output data at six hourly intervals. This is a, it's a gigantic amount of data. What Codex has come up with is that within reason, what we can manage is from 1950 onwards, right? It could have started from year zero, but that's a whole bunch of data we can't really afford to produce and keep and easily. So these, these dates are practical and pragmatic, right? 1950, if you ask most climate scientists, goes back far enough that we have a decent enough historical period, right? That you can compare with the future. So, yep. So here's a good one. So this is from Vic Andrich at the Department of Health. It's got, will the model be able to match or link with non-climatic data sets such as the ABS or socioeconomic areas or geographical areas? So I guess we're talking about layer, overlay layers for helping, I guess, with the decision and planning aspects. Maybe you want to answer that one, Kevin. I mean, that's that's the ambition. We know that climate data, to make it important for policy decisions, needs to be able to be overlapped with other data, whether that's your infrastructure footprint, your socioeconomic variables data from the APS. It is, again, it, it's challenging. Um, we've got a big job ahead of us. We know that people um, with these skills can download it into GIS and then overlay data and different data sets. So that is the goal. It's the ambition um, to be continued. <laughs> so yeah, I can explain a bit more on that. So there is a, a smaller group within Western Australia, which is part of a bigger network called the HEAL network. HEAL is a massive NHMRC grant led from ANU and their aim is to look at health and climate. And there's a smaller group within Western Australia that I'm part of, that includes me and health researchers and child health researchers. And this is what this group would like to do, which will be when we have all, of, all the climate data available to use a very, I guess, post-process and refined version of the projections that can be then overlaid over socioeconomic areas, um, LGAs and whatnot. So people are thinking about this um, as the data becomes available. My hope is that the, this sort of research will start happening organically. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another one from an, another question from online. I think that you sort of answered this, but perhaps um, expand on that a little bit. And it's, um, are the downscaled models atmosphere only or are they running coupled atmosphere, ocean, in brackets, vegetation models? So the, the models we are running are, have definitely have a dynamic atmosphere and we've set them up with dynamic vegetation as well. Um, so so the um, something, called, we call, something we call the leaf area index changes for different types of vegetation as the climate changes, we definitely do not have a dynamic ocean. So the ocean doesn't change as the winds change, right? The ocean, so the sea surface temperatures are given to the model from the driving model, from, from the CMIP6 GCM or ERA5 reanalysis. That doesn't change. We just interpolate in space and time. And as I alluded to, whilst this is a limitation, it's just really, really complicated to do dynamic everything. Um, a, a question here from Aish. Um, how important is it for the general public or policymakers to understand the real detail of climate science? <laughs> mm. It is, it's very important, but the way that we can communicate it um, can certainly be done in a way that allows policy officers, whether you're in Department of Education or Health, to understand and use this data in a way that you can make meaningful decisions. 
there's still a long way that we can do when we go about communicating climate science and projections. And Jartan certainly alluded it to it in his speech around how it's a real focus and at the heart of this project. Um, so I think, <laughs> yes, yeah, it's it's important. We know we need to get better at communicating it. We have that ambition and we're working across the country with our national partnerships to try and come together uh, and do a, a better job than has been done in the past. Okay, so um, this one's a bit, a bit about expanding the scale a little bit. So um, it's from Barbara. She's asked, do you have climate projections or does someone have climate projections for Southeast Asia and Pacific Islands? And if not, who, do you know if this is going to be done, if there are plans for somebody to be doing this um, sort of work? Um, there is certainly a Cordex region for Southeast Asia. So there are modelling groups out there simulating the Southeast Asia region. Uh, if that person can drop me an email, I can probably point them to where they can find where all of that is summarized. There definitely is. Um, th there are projections for Southeast Asia, I'm sure. Talk a little bit longer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> This is good. This is another good question from Ryan. Okay. So with weather changing in an increasing amount of ways or, you know, it's highly variable and more un, um, more unpredictable, will the model be able to acknowledge sea level rise or non-standard weather? And I'm just going to say that unless anyone else in the room has got a burning question, we will probably make this the last question and then move outside where we have a wonderful array and selection of um, refreshments outside. I'll, I'll also leave, um, I'll also get everyone to have like a final comment. Um, so sea level rise is very important. Um, unfortunately, the model we are going to run, because it doesn't have a dynamic ocean, we won't be able to tell you anything directly from the model outputs about sea level rise, right? But what we can do, um, we know that sea level rise is not just sea level rise which matters, it's when it coincides with high tide and storms coming in, right? So this is not quite my area of expertise, but I believe from the outputs we will produce, you will be able to, for example, use the winds from our model to get a better idea of, of how sea level rise changes in the future. So we, we, we're we not going to, one of the outputs we produce is not going to be sea level rise. So we can't do that directly. But um, I'm sure there's people out there, sea level rise researchers, who know how to use what we produce with other data sets to make some, you know, to 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 make some informed um, predictions about what sea level rise looks like regionally. And this is where I'm really hoping that other researchers will use what we've produced and run, you know, their sea level rise model, which they've developed and they know all about it. Right, so that that's the hope. Okay, so um, is there anyone else in the room with a burning question? Oh, one one last one from online. So, do you see a future where community members will have usable data that enables them to participate and lead in local climate planning activities, Kelly? I do see a future in that. I think that's where we have to go. Uh, it is incredibly important that different sectors, communities and individuals can understand and use this data if we are to adapt. We've got a challenging future ahead of us. Uh, it is certainly hard to do, but that doesn't mean we can't do it nor that we should do it. Um, so I think um, I'm, I'm an optimist and that's where my passion for this project comes through. That's where I want um, to see the future. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, just this is a bit of a tangent from that question, but as community members, as everyone sitting here, there's an increasing recognition in, in climate science and in big data generally that citizen science has a huge role to play. Just one example of what the Americans do very well but we don't do as well is hail reports. So when it hails, 
it's really hard to know where it hailed because it's so localized. So when it hails, please take pictures of the hail and put it on social media because people are developing algorithms to, 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 to extract hail reports from the public. So when we have very highly localized extreme events, these type of um, you know, citizen science data becomes really, really useful. We don't, I don't know of a coordinated project to try to make that happen. I think people are starting to develop apps where you can actually upload pictures of hail or other things to the app, and hence we capture that data. Really, really important, and it really, I think really, really cool too. Yeah. So there, there's a massive role for citizen science and community involvement. Okay, so I'm just going to ask both of you to make a final comment, something that you like, I mean, you've both already given take home messages, but maybe like a really punchy take home message for everyone to leave with today. <laughs> so I guess it's uh, like for me personally, it's probably the most exciting time in my career because this is the first time I'm seeing state government go, we need to fund climate science for the state. Before coming to Murdoch, I was a, I'm a Murdoch alumni, I did my bachelor and PhD here, and I went to UNSW and lived in New South Wales for a while, and I was like, wow, New South Wales does so much, right? And to me, it, this is, it's really exciting, it's, this is just the start, and I think it's a start that I'm really hoping will not end, as in this will just build up and we will get better and better at it. Right now, we just have stuff running on the supercomputer, not much to show for in terms of a portal, but just bear with us, it will get there. Thanks. We've spent a lot of time today talking about projections and science, um, and that just reflects where we are at the stage of this project. It's taken two years for us to work through challenges around how do we set up these projections, where do we find the data from, how do we partner with other jurisdictions so that we don't duplicate, that we can leverage capability, setting up partnerships with New South Wales, Murdoch and um, Pawsey. And so today has focused on, you know, our, our science plans, but I think as we've heard from the questions, there's a real interest and also the importance of communicating this information once we start generating it. Uh, and I think that is where um, we've got a lot of room um, to grow and it's where we're going to need help from every government agency, every sector to help us analyse this data, produce it into meaningful insights uh, and really learn from it because only then is it going to be useful. Okay, well, thank you both of you. I'd like the room to join me in thanking you for what you've done today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to thank the people that have joined us online. Unfortunately, you can't see where we are, which is in this very beautiful um, Bullock Catagen building at Murdoch University. And we're about to go and have refreshments out looking over the wetlands. Um, it's very nice here. So thank you very much for joining us online. And everyone in the room, you're very welcome to come and join us out on the balcony outside. <laughs>